Okay, so welcome to the sixth lecture. And the topic for this lecture is power series representation of analytic functions. Okay, so last time we talked about the definition of line integrals, which is this. Okay, the line integral of f along the path, along the curve. Well, if gamma is smooth, then we can bring the derivative down, right? And also we have an important inequality, which is this one. Now, if gamma is smooth, then V, the total variation can be, become this one, okay? And we also have the most important, which is the fundamental theorem, fundamental theorem of calculus version for like the line integral versions, okay? So, and today's topic will show that analytic function has so many good properties. It has power theory expansion and it is infinite differentiable and it has the primitive, okay, which is very, 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 very good. And to start, uh, let's talk about a proposition, all right, which is the Leibniz rule, okay. So we're basically, we have this function being continuous and we define g by this. So gt, if each gt, we fix a t, and we're integrating with respect to s. And then we have g is continuous. Now, if the partial derivative with respect to t exists and is a continuous function, so if this function is continuous, or and is analytic with respect to the variable t, then g is also analytic, and we have this formula. Okay, so first let's prove that g is continuous, and because phi is continuous on a compact set, so it's uniformly continuous, which means that we have this. Okay, now in particular, when t1, t2 are delta closed, then gt1 minus gt2, here we use the inequality, right? And it's less than this. Okay, because these two, they're less than epsilon. So B minus A times epsilon, okay? Now we just let epsilon go to zero, then we have the desired result, which is that G is continuous, okay? Now, secondly, what we wanna show that is, if this exists in continuous, then G is analytic and we have this thing. Now, it's sufficient to show that g is differentiable because one implies g prime is continuous. So if we verify this, then back to part one, because this is continuous, right? But this is continuous by this part, right? So after verify formula. So first we let phi two be the partial derivative and phi two is uniformly continuous. So again, we use the condition of being uniformly continuous. And now we fix a T naught such that when T and T naught are delta close, and for any S and A, B, we have this is true, right? Now, for this, we then yield this inequality. So how do we get this inequality? Because, so let's look at this integral. Well, tau, the variable tau is in t and t naught, which means that tau and t naught are what? Tau and t naught are delta close because t and t naught are delta close and tau are between them, okay? Which is obvious. And we use this inequality, with, with, right? We have this inequality, so we can bring this, and this is less than epsilon, right? So epsilon times t minus t naught, okay? And so we're gonna keep this inequality first. Now we fix another S, we define this function. And to be defined like this, we have by direct computation, we have its derivative is equal to this. Okay, is equal to this. Well, by fundamental theorem calculus and this, we then have this, right? Because, well, you're with respect to tau, then you are the primitive of this function, 
the permit of this function is this, right? With t minus t naught, okay? t minus t naught, the primitive, okay? Because its derivative, tau is tau minus, right? So it's, it's by fundamental theorem of calculus. And, and now we plug in, we use this substitution. We just, we just plug in into this, okay? We just plug in directly and regroup for any s and t and t naught are delta closed. Now, let's consider this integral, okay? So this is the thing inside. We just copy directly, okay? We copy directly, and then we integrate along a, b with respect to s, and we take the absolute value, and then we divide t minus t naught. So for this, we can bring this in, right? We bring we bring this in. We bring this in, and this cancels out, right? And we use the linearity. We use the linearity, which minus this, right? Which yields this, okay? This is really just the definition of G because we have to find, we have to find G to be this. Right, g is this. Now observe that st is just gt. st naught is g gt naught. I mean in integrate right on the integral side. Right, so we have this minus this. Whoa. Whoa. What we did here is that we did here right. So really, just we are also doing here. We divide by t minus t naught. And they will integrate along a to b, right? So this cancels, and this gives you back b minus a epsilon, right? Which gives this. So we have this inequality, and we let epsilon go to zero. We say that g is differentiable, and its derivative is equal to this at t naught. Is equal to phi two t naught, where phi two is really just we define to be the partial derivative, which totally explains this formula all right so we have the Leibniz rule we're going to use it later well with this result we can show that this integral is equal to 2 pi if the absolute value of z is less than 1 so why we need this requirement let's take a look we define phi s t to be this okay so the phi s is the s and t we, we join the t so this be phi s t for t being 0 and 1 and s being 0 and 2 pi. Now we take its partial derivative, we calculate it, it gets this. Well, because z is, the absolute value of z is less than 1, right? So this is a point on a circle, right? You get a point on a circle and you're subtracting, you're subtracting some t, but t is between 0 and 1. And the absolute value of z is less than 1, which means that you will never reach the origin, right? You won't never reach the origin because the, the norm of this complex value is less than 1. So if you want to reach the origin, one thing you need is that, oh, we're on the, so here is es, is, it's on a circle, and you're subtracting some complex number. It might go here, it might go there, but it might go here, but it will never go to the origin. Right, which means that this is non-vanishing. Why it does not go to the origin? Because the norm of z is less than one. Okay, which means that it's never zero. Right, this is what I'm saying. Well, then we define this is analytic. Okay. Now, g zero is equal to two pi. Why? Okay, let's see what is g zero. G zero is phi s zero ds, which is which is this. 0 to 2 pi 1 right which is 2 pi yeah which is 2 pi if we can show that g prime is 0 then we know that g1 is equal to 2 pi is one we want why do we want g1 is equal to 2 pi because when g g1 is just this a b right which is just this we want this to be 2 pi right we want this. So we, if we can show this, then we're done. G prime is equal to zero. Now, G prime of T. 
is equal to this, and we integrate along under the integral sign. I mean, we differentiate it under the integral sign. Now we fix a t. We define this function. We define this function to be equal to this. Okay. So, well, what we want is that we have, after we define this, we see that the derivative is this. The derivative of this, which is direct computation, gives this. But this is really just this. They're the same. Okay. So here we use the fundamental theorem calculus again, which means that g prime t is equal to this of 2 pi minus this is 0. Okay, minus 0. Well, what is 2 pi and 0? So the variable is s. Okay, the only variable is s. Now e to i0 and e to i2 pi, they're the same. So you get 0. Right? Okay, so we have proven this with the absolute value of z is less than 1. Because it is crucial because with this, we have that the denominator won't vanish. So we get like continuous or differentiable analytic functions, okay? Alright, so let's keep going. Um, well, we're going to use this to prove a, a proposition which we'll use to prove our main theorem. So this proposition states that if G is analytic and suppose we have a closed ball that is contained in G. Now, if gamma t is a plus r e i t, so we have a ball, a, with radius r. Gamma is a plus r e i t, so gamma is the curve. Okay, this is gamma, a plus r e i t. Then f z is equal to this formula, along the curve gamma, so along the circle, integrate along the circle. Fw over w minus z with respect to the variable w. So, like, it's just a fancy looking formula. For z and a, for z inside the ball. Okay? So, the proof is that we want to show, so we fix z such that it's, it's in the ball. We want to show that fz is equal to this, right? This is what we want to show. Well, to this, we apply the definition of integral along the circle, which is 0 to pi of f of w, which is a plus r e i s. And w we substitute in r e i s plus a, which is this. And we, time, we multiply the derivative of this, a plus r e i s, the derivative, which is r e i s times i are you bringing i down but here we have 2 pi i here so here the i is gone because we have an i here and when they cancels out okay so this is what we want to show what well, we can do this because a lot of circle is like almost of course it's smooth right now with this we just rearrange okay rearrange we give this Okay, we multiply 2 pi over there, okay, and by 2 pi, and we subtract them, and we bring this in, okay, we bring this in, well, 2 pi fz is equal to 0 to 2 pi fz dw, right, so we can bring this in, ds or whatever, which is, this is equal to, so this is what we want to show, okay, so don't be terrified, it's just, the logic is clear, but it looks ugly, I understand that, okay? Now, phi st, we define phi st to be this function. Okay, this is another long as looking qu equation. Well, s is the variable on the power, and t is the thing here, okay? Minus fz for t 0 to 1 and s 0 to 2 pi. Now we calculate its partial derivative with respect to t, we got this which is analytic, right? Because f is analytic, right? Then this is continuous and this is also continuous. So this is continuous, which means that this is analytic with respect to value, um, I mean, variable t, right? And as usual, we define gt to be this. Now we know that it's analytic, right? We know this analytic. So 
we want to show that g1 is equal to 0. So what is g1? g1 is equal to this. Well, this is 1, right? So the z cancels out. So it's really just this. Okay, it's really just this. g1 is equal to 0. So to show this, we do it by showing that g0 is 0 and g prime is equal to 0. So first, we show that 0, 0 is 0. g0 is this, is equal to this. We just plug in. Okay, now we have, we can bring this fz outside minus 2 pi fz. Okay, and this thing above, this, because z is in a circle, right? Then this thing, the absolute value of this thing is less than 1. This entire thing. Like, this, this entire thing is z, right? And we know that z is less than 1. Okay? So then we have this entire thing is equal to 2 pi. Then is equal to 0, because you're subtracting them, right? Then g0 is 0. Now we want to show that g prime is 0. Well, g prime t is equal to this. We know that. Now, for each t, not in 0, so in a half open interval, we define this function again. Well, the, I mean, the purpose is to show that its derivative is equal to this. So you have a primitive. Well, if you have a primitive, then by fundamental theory calculus, g prime t is equal to this. Well, it's 0 again because the variable s only happens here, and i0, ei0, and ei2 pi are the same. So when you subtract them, it gives you 0 back. Okay? Well, then it proves our result. Okay? So note, which proves the proposition. Now, we let z minus a less than r, and w is on a circle, on a circle, which means that we have this. Now, 1 over w minus z, we have by algebra, simple algebra, and this we observe that is the power series, or the geometric sum series. Well, this converges because z minus a is less than r, which is equal to w minus a. Okay, so divide by w and z, it's less than 1. Okay, so this converges, which is equal to this. Okay, now we multiply both sides by f w divided by 2 pi i, and then we integrate along this circle on the variable w to the left hand side. Right, the left hand side, we observe that. We divide, we multiply this, and we integrate along the path, along the circle with respect to w, which gives you fz back, right? By proposition, by the last proposition, which is proven. Okay, but we're doing the same thing to here, and they're equal to each other, right? They're equal to each other. Well, what if we doing the same thing here? What about the right hand side after we did the same thing? Okay, so this leads to a lemma, which states that. Gamma's rectifiable curve and suppose that f n and f are continuous function on the trace. So and we have this uniform convergence. Then we have this. Okay? So this is basically we have this. This is our formula. We can integrate, I mean we can interchange the limit and the integral sign if we have uniform convergence. Okay? So the proof is really easy because so we just write out the condition of being uniform convergence and we have this is equal to this which is less than equal to the supremum okay so we choose the epsilon to be epsilon divided by total variation so that when we do this is less than equal to epsilon because the supremum is less than equal to this the supremum is less than or equal to this, right? Because this is served as an upper bound, then the least upper bound, of course, should be bounded by this. And when we cancel out this, we get this back, okay? So is it such that for any n, we have this is less than e epsilon, okay? Okay, so this proves the, the lemma. Now, here comes our big theorem. Our big theorem states that if f is analytic in the circle on a disk, then you can express f as a power series. So as long as you're analytic, then you have a power series expansion. 
for z minus a less than r, so for each point in your domain. And we have a n is equal to this. Remember, this is this is the formula for the coefficient we have proven in our like second lecture or third lecture. I forgot, but but this theory has a radius of convergence greater equal to r. Okay, so our goal is to show that if you're analytic, then you have a power series expansion, something that seems impossible to prove. Right. All right. Let's just start. We're gonna use our proposition we have proven before. So we pick little r between them, right? Such that the closed ball is contained in the open ball. Well, this is also of course doable. Okay. Now we let gamma t is is the is the path along the along the boundary of the circle. Okay. Then we know that this is true, right? We have proven this already. Because I mean, because let's see, let's take a look. Right, the closed ball. Okay, the closed ball. Okay, the closed ball. And we're gonna use our lemma, since Z is in the the close and W is on a circle. Right, W is on a circle. Then. We know that for this thing, it's less than equal to m times r times z minus a divided by r to the power of n. So fw is the bound of f. Okay, the fw is the bound of f. Well, because you're continuous on a closed ball, well, well, closed ball is what? It's bounded and closed, which is compact. So you're uniformly continuous. I mean, if you're continuing, if it continues on a compact set, then your image is also compact, which is bounded. So you have a bound. Okay, you're guaranteed to have a bound. Okay. Now, observe this. We can apply M test. Because Z minus A is less than R. Right? We can apply the M test. So this converges. If this converges, then this thing uniformly converges. Right? This sum here this sum converges uniformly in w on your trace the circle okay so by note right above we note remember our discussion here so by note we have this right and f said which is this we multiply this this and agree along the path with respect to w we do the same thing with this which is times this over this right and integrate the whole thing uh, on path with respect to w okay so how do we manipulate this so here we can bring the fw this inside the summation so that well this increased by one or dw so here we have lemma right because we know that this converges uniformly Okay, we have uniform convergence. Well, we, we can just take off the absolute value sign because when we're taking sum, like the sum with the absolute value sign is less than this. Okay, so without the absolute value sign, okay, it's still a bound. So, okay, I'm actually tripping. Okay, the, the <laughs> statement of M test. Okay, this is a statement of M test. Okay. I forgot this statement. I took a look. This is totally wrong, I'm sorry. So, but, well, we get this conversion uniformly, then we can interchange this, right? And we bring this in, and we have something like this. Okay, because we can bring this outside because we're respect to W, right? Okay, now if we let this thing go to a n, so this could be a n z minus a to the n. Take a sum, right? Well, this a n, we have our r, and we have our gamma, and we have our z gives our a n. Okay, so this a n seems like is like kind of depend on so many stuff, right? But a n is independent of z, 
because we have we can't find anything z in here, right? So it's independent of z. If it's independent of z, then you're ch you chose you choose r, you choose gamma. Then in a circle, for any z, we have f z is a n of this. Right, so it's a power series that converges for here. Well, as long we have it's a power series that converges for this inside this region, we can apply our theory for power series, which is that the coefficient is equal to this. Well, if we have this, we see that a n is independent of gamma and an r again. Right? Is we have no gamma and r involved in our definition of a n here. We can do this because we have shown that f z is a power series. Right, because it's independent of z, so so it's independent of z, so it's a power series for any z minus a less than r. And with this, we can show that it's independent of gamma and r. So, no matter what gamma, no matter what r, no matter what z, f z is equal to this for any s minus a less than r and for any r less than capital R. Okay, I hope you understand this. Then, we know that this for any z minus a less than r. So the radius of convergence is, uh, is greater than or equal to r because we have this convergence for any less than r. So the radius of convergence should be at least r. Okay? So here we have proven our result, which is a big result. So if you're analytic, you have a power series representation. And here brings our corollaries. Analytic then is infinitely differentiable because you have a power series expansion. The power series are infinitely differentiable. And for analytic, then we have this. Well, this is just the, the formula of, of, of our a n here, right? If uh, we just, I mean, this, where, where gamma is chosen like this and this, okay? Well, we just do this and do this. We just isolate this. So we have, well, this is exactly this thing, okay? For for a given gamma, okay? For a given gamma and given r. Now we have a Cauchy's estimate. If you're analytic in the disk, and we suppose that you're bounded. So suppose this is a bound. This is the bound. Okay, suppose this is one bound. Then we have this inequality. Okay? So what is this Cauchy's estimate? So if r is less than r, we can apply 2.13, right? We, 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 just apply, we can apply this formula, given r less than capital R. Then we have this is equal to this, right? Okay, now this thing is less than or equal to this times the supreme of this times the total variation of this, okay? Less than or equal to. And the supreme of this, well, which is uh, less than or equal to, right, the supremum, m, m is just a bound, okay, but we're talking about supremum, so we can just add a less than or equal to sign, but it's not important, so as long as we have, we have this one less than or equal, then we're like good, right, then we have w minus, w is on a circle, so which is equal to r, well, and this, because it's smooth, we have this, and for this, by calculation, right, just calculate. What is the derivative of A plus R E I? I mean, T. The derivative is I R E I T. And we take absolute value, which gives you R E I T. Right? And we just use the fundamental theorem calculus. We well just do our computation. This is gonna be equal to two pi, and this thing cancels out gives. I mean two pi r. I'm sorry, and this cancels out gives you this. Yes. Now, we take limit of r approaching to r from a negative part. I mean negative side. The this keeps the same, but this is equal to this. So no matter what, we have this. The Cauchy estimate, as desired. Okay, so if we keep moving, 
We conclude this section by proving a proposition, which is a special case of a more general result, which is represented later. Okay, so we proved some, something more general, but let's prove this first. So if f is analytic in the disk, and suppose that gamma is a closed rectifiable curve and has a primitive in this. If you're a closed curve, if you have a primitive and you have a closed curve, then there's of course zero. The key thing is that if you're analytic, then you have a primitive, right? This assumption that gamma is a closed curve and does equal zero, like we already have it by fundamental theorem calculus, right? So our goal is to show that f has a primitive. Well, f is analytic on the on the on the ball, right? Then, if it's analytic, you have a power series representation. Wow. Right. Then, we define f z to be equal to this. Okay. So the so, the purpose of defining this is that well if we can differentiate this this cancels out which is a n z minus a n which is equal to f right so we want to show that this is analytic well to show this is analytic well is equal to this right because the limit of this is equal to one right the limit of this is equal to one the radius of convergence for f is the same as the radius of convergence for f. Why? Okay, so we have the lens soup of a n n plus 1 1 over n is equal to a n. I mean, I mean... So why is this true, given that the limit of this is equal to 1? To prove this, you can show it by, I mean, binomial theorem or something, okay? I'll just, I'll just not spend time proving this, because it's, it's not related to our main discussion. And this, we have, our, we have to shout out to our lemma from lecture 2, our last lemma, is that if B has a limit, and a is the limb soup. So the limb soup of a and b n is the limit of one of them times the limb soup of another. Right? Like this, we have this limit, then the limit of this, I mean, it's reciprocal is still one, right? Because this will never vanish, right? So we apply our lemma, gives our this, because, because this is one times this, right? The limb soup of this times this is the limit of this, which is 1 times the limb soup of this one. Okay? So we have the same radius of convergence. If they have the same convergence, and we know that, well, if your power series the radius of convergence, we know that you can differentiate term-wise. You can differentiate term-wise. We bring this down, this goes to n, a n, z minus a, gives you f z. So f has a primitive. So if we can bring our like if you're analytic, then we can talk about power series, and we can use our knowledge from power series, right? We can get so many beautiful results. Okay, so this concludes this lecture.